I'm Claudia Taylor, Director of Regional Programming for the UNC Alumni Association, and welcome to episode five of UNC Alumni Live. Today, I hope you all have your wine glasses ready because we are visiting again with UNC alum, John Matthews, owner of Casaro Winery and Vineyard. If you joined us for episode one of our series, you'll remember John and his awesome tour of the winery, but today we're actually getting to taste of the fantastic wines and learn more about how they're made and how to pair them with all our favorite foods. Before we get started, just a few reminders. If you're joining us on Zoom, please check out the chat function at the bottom of your screen. I'll be posting some useful links there uh, and you can use that to send me your questions for John. If you're watching on Facebook Live, we're trying something new this week. Uh, you can open up the UNT Alumni Association app, uh, go to events and then check in for this event. And you just hit the code 51280. And that will let us know that you're watching uh, from Facebook. Uh, you can also leave us questions in the Facebook comments and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Now, before I hand the program over to Casey, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our featured guest, John Matthews. John earned a bachelor's degree from UNT in 1983 and an MBA in 1987. After graduating, he had a long career as a Dallas police officer. He has appeared as a regular CNN and Fox News analyst and has served as a White House advisor. He's also published seven books, one of which is being made into a major motion picture. Now, one of the many hats he wears is owning and operating Casaro Winery and Vineyard, which produces the official wine of the UNT Alumni Association, the North Texas Tempranillo. Today, we'll get a true insider's look into the world of wine and learn how to impress our friends with our sommelier talent once we're able to have friends over again. <laughs> now, grab your bottle of North Texas Tempranillo and let's get started. <laughs> Casey, take it away. Thank you, Claudia. And thank you guys so much for joining us. I am really excited to be out of my office for one day uh, to socially distance with John Matthews at Casaro Winery. I am in one room and John is two doors away from me. So <laughs> we are playing things very safe and they've got things very nice and neat and clean here. So John, thank you so much for having me out here. It's, a, it's such a pleasure and a treat to be here. And like I said, be out of my office. <laughs> thank you. It's great just to welcome people back again, Casey. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Hey, John, you're not going to believe what I got in the mail today. Like literally moments before I got here, I have to show you this. Oh, no. Can you see that? <laughs> the eyeball killer, yeah. <laughs> The eyeball killer. Um, John, you've got tons of stories for us, but you know, I don't want to just focus on you know, your book and your movie you have coming up because we have some delicious wine to try here in just a minute. But um, I want to let everybody know that if you haven't heard already, John just produced a podcast for us in partnership with the OLLI, uh, the o Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. So John, thank you so much for taking the time to do that and tell your story as, um, as a beat officer, police officer, and capturing Dallas's very first or only serial killer. Is it still the only serial killer to this date? I think it's still the only, at least the only kind of homegrown serial killer, put it that way. Well, let's keep it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. So guys, if you have an opportunity, um, visit ollie, O-L-L-I dot U-N-T dot E-D-U and scroll to the bottom and check out those podcasts. You can hear podcasts from uh, Dr. David Wolf and John Matthews, and we have a few more in the works. So check them out. And uh, if you're interested, check out the membership plans that they have available for you as well. So John, would you please tell me about those three bottles you have sitting in front of you? I am very excited to learn. We're, we're all set up for you, Casey, as you and Claudia and Amanda remember, when we first started talking about this alumni series, we wanted it to be a virtual happy hour. Well, it doesn't get any happier than having three bottles of wine and our favorite UNT wine, our North Texas Tempranillo. So I've kind of got a typical setup here for a wine tasting like we'd be doing it. As a matter of fact, if you hear some people in the background, we are open down here in Oville again, which is about 20 minutes south of Dallas. We have limited capacity inside, but we've got nearly three acres of property and we can scatter folks out um, outside on the picnic tables, gazebos, pergolas, the swings. We have great outdoor space. So if you hear folks in the background, they're coming for their Thursday happy hour. But for our happy hour, we've got three different wines that we're going to taste today. Um, I've also got some water. You always 
want to have a little craft of water so you can wash off your glass and uh, have somewhere to dump it into. We've got a little crackers for you, oyster crackers to kind of smooth your palate, cleanse your palate in between the tastings. But we're going to start off with our Pinot Grigio, which is our white wine uh, that we make here at Casaro. One of the whites that we make, we make several. Um, then we're going to move on to our Avanti Rosé, and I'll kind of describe each one of them as, as we move through the tasting here. And then we're going to end up, of course, with our great North Texas Tempranillo. And it's been really refreshing since the first time we did this to see the UMT alum come by. At that time, they were doing curbside pickup, uh, then come on out to the property once we opened up a couple weeks ago and, and ordering the UMT Tempranillo online so that they can participate in this virtual tasting. And we had many of the alumni that ordered all three of these bottles so that they can participate. So we want to hear from you, chat your comments and questions as you sip the wine, drink the wine, taste the wine, and let me know kind of what you think of it. Uh, the Pinot Grigio is going to be served uh, chilled as well as the rosé and then the Tempranillo as at room temperature. My biggest nightmare is not unmuting Zoom, right? Claudia and I have talked about this many times. Well, there you have it. You know, I'm human too. So, um, John, as far as the, the chilling these these white wines, the rosé, what is the ideal temperature there? Well, I think we keep our chillers at around 43 degrees is what we can keep it here at the winery. Um, you just want to make sure with your whites and your rosés that you know, you've got a nice chill on it, stick it in the refrigerator for a little bit. I don't ever recommend sticking it in the freezer. Yes, I know it gets cold, but if you forget about it, then it can actually, uh, you know, be detrimental to the wine. And depending on how the wine was cold stabilized when it was made, you may even get tartrate to uh, form the bottle, which we call uh, ice crystals. And so those little wine crystals are ice crystals. You may see that if you forget your bottle of wine in the freezer. So we recommend put in the refrigerator. If you don't have a wine chiller, serve your whites, your rosés chilled and your reds at room temperature. That's great information. In fact, I know exactly what you're talking about. Unfortunately, I'm speaking, you know, I've experienced, what did you call it? The tartrates? Is that yes. right? Okay. It freaked me out the first time I saw it. I went, what is wrong with my wine? Of course, I was just in a hurry and threw it in the freezer. So now I know it's- and and that's really more appearance, Casey. I mean, it's not going to be that detrimental as far as the taste, uh, but it does. People kind of will pour the glass of wine and go, oh my gosh, what is this? For sure. So, all right, you said we're going to dive right in and try out the Pinot Grigio first. Is that correct? Yeah, the Pinot Grigio is one of our latest wines here at Cazaro. It's actually got the brand new 2020 Casaro label on it, which has a picture of the vineyards, which are about two minutes from here. And let me tell you, the vines are coming along great this year. We've had a pretty mild spring, not uh, really hot uh, temperatures yet, and that has really done well. The Alberino, the grapes look really, really good. Our Sangiovese and Tempranillo. Um, so we've been out in the vineyard a lot lately, checking out the grapes, seeing how they're coming along and progressing and it's really, really looking good for this year. So I've got a bottle of our Pinot Grigio here, which is a white wine. Uh, Pinot Grigio um, is a cousin, you might say, to the Pinot Noir. One of the things that you're gonna notice, uh, first of all, and I'm gonna take you through a little wine tasting 101. How about if we do that? And I'll, I'll kind of show you as we're tasting wine, what we look for. There are three main elements. And so you talk about impressing your friends at a party. So Casey, now you can go back and, and, and when we get together virtually or in person, you can say, well, the first thing that we want to do is we want to look at the wine, okay? We want to look at the color and the clarity of wine. We want to make sure you can see Casey, our Pinot Grigio is almost perfectly clear. I mean, we filter it, uh, 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 I think more than many uh, wineries. I like my wine clear. I don't like any sediment in there. I like being able to hold it up to the light and go, wow, that really looks good. Um, and so the first step in wine tasting is visual. You want to say, okay, what does that wine look like? And, and all you're using all of your senses in wine tasting. So we're going to use our, our sense of sight and kind of look at that and say, does that look like a, a good wine? We're going to swirl it around a little bit 
and look at the legs, which will kind of give us an idea of the alcohol content. Um, and uh, the more alcohol, the higher the alcohol content, the more legs you see that will form on the sides of the glass. So the first step is visual. Does it look like a wine needs to look? If you think, see chunks floating around in it, not only is it not going to look good, uh, but it's telling your brain, hey, something's wrong with this wine. Uh, and we've had people that, uh, well, we've been in competitions and stuff, folks that, that don't treat their wine like we do, and they'll actually have things still floating in their wine. And we're like, oh, that's probably not very good. So the first step is color and clarity. This is really good. This is very appetizing. Yeah, Casey, you're doing really good. You're, you're a lot closer to the camera, so you see it a lot better than mine. You know, by the way, besides the car, uh, the sorrow glass, I do have my UNT North Texas tumblers. So uh, I have those prepared and ready for me. The next step in tasting wine is what? What do you think? We looked at it. Next, we're gonna we're gonna smell it, and don't be afraid to put your nose in the glass. Oh, good, because that's I just did that. You, you, yeah, you don't have to be this little dainty. Stay away. That's not how you get that aroma in the glasses. I think someone asked that question last time we were on. Does the glass make a difference? And it definitely makes a difference. There are red wine glasses, white wine glasses, but the size of the top of the glass how much air gets in it, how it allows it to breathe, how it, um, when you drink it, where it falls on your tongue, all of that is a factor of the glass. So make sure you have a good glass with you or a North Texas tumbler, um, or if you're outside, grab your red Solo cup, it's still wine, let's face it. Um, so the second step is the aroma, and we want to smell it, and we want to see what is that telling our brain, because everything is prepping us to taste the wine. Casey, what do you smell? And, and maybe some of you can type in or chat in what you smell when you smell this Pinot Grigio. Well, John, I prepared specifically for today by using a strict regimen of uh, Claritin and Flonase. So I hope that my, my, my nasal passages don't fail me today. Um, you know, John, honestly, besides grapes, I think I pick up, <laughs> sorry, that, that was a dumb joke, uh, is I, grapefruity, like very citrusy and I'm not good at this. Maybe some pear. <laughs> maybe some pear. That's some definitely apple. pear. Yeah. 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 You, you can pick it up on the nose. This has a great nose on it. As soon as you pick it up and start to smell, you literally don't have to put your nose all the way in. You can start smelling. You're swirling the wine and you can start smelling. Really what that's telling us, Casey, is we look at it. It looks like it's going to be good to drink. Now we're smelling it and it's telling our brain, wow. We're excited. We think this is going to be something good. Some uh, wines, when you take them out, you smell and there's almost no aroma to it. Well, that's, what is that telling your brain? Wait a minute. Is this wine not good? Or on the other side of it, you smell what? Vinegar. Never, ever want to smell vinegar. And if a wine gets corked, um, which means that, that actually the cork was not sealed correctly, you can actually get a musty kind of smell to it. So this is very, very, um, just a great aroma, a great fruit forward smell. I'm picking up pears, I'm picking up apples, um, maybe, maybe a little citrus, like you said, a nectarine or something. Uh, and it's telling my brain, hey, I'm ready to drink it. I'm, I'm definitely ready to drink this. Like, I appreciate, no, <laughs> I will say, John, I, seriously, I could smell this without getting it close to my nose. That's really yeah. impressive. And I like that so much thought goes into the clarity and the color and the quality of the wine, just like, you know, a, a lovely food presentation when you go out to eat at a nice restaurant, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into that. And it all makes sense psychologically now, right? You know, so I love that the color of this, there's almost hardly any color here. And uh, now going back to the legs real quick, you mentioned that the more legs the wine has, the higher the alcohol content. Is right. And you can kind of see that because the alcohol stays on the side of the glass uh, a little bit longer. And that's what you see kind of going down. All of these wines are in a really close range, though. So we don't uh, um, have any wines over like 16%. Um, all of them are, are below that. Most of our wines are around 12 
uh, 12 five. The Tempranillo is a, a, a little bit more. Uh, this one is just about 12, 11, eight, I think is where this one falls. Um, and so you're not gonna see the legs nearly as much as this as we will on the Tempranillo. All right. You ready to taste it? Let's do it. Salud. Salud. I don't want to make any mouth noises and the audience have to listen to me sip and gurgle and slurp. So I'm trying to do this very, you know, ladylike, but you know, is it normal to kind of let it slurp around in your mouth and, and let it roll around or is it best to just let it go? Now, if you're doing a tasting, yeah, you want it to kind of roll on your palate. You want to feel how kind of how it hits your palate. Is it on the front of your tongue, the back of your tongue? Is there an aftertaste to it? And this is, is, it tastes like it smelled. That's the best way I can describe it. It has this wonderful, smooth, fruity kind of taste, not in a sweet way. This is not a sweet wine, although you can take a Pinot Grigio and you can make a semi-sweet. You can even make a sweet Pinot Grigio. So when the customers come in, we have to explain to them, no, this is a dry Pinot Grigio. We didn't add any additional sugar to it. So it's a dry white wine but it has that wonderful kind of refreshing. Can you imagine sitting outside, it's hot and, and you've been working outside, you open a nice cold bottle of this Pinot Grigio. I mean, it's, it's so easy to drink. So yes, I agree. It is absolutely delicious. Um, John, has this been entered into any competitions yet? I know this Not is a very new release. Yes. yes, we just released this. And at our first pickup party for our wine club members on June 7th, it'll be their very first opportunity to, uh, to get in their package our new Pinot Grigio and our brand new Multiple Chano, which I'm really, really excited about. And just so you know, um, a lot of the competitions were pushed back because of the pandemic and COVID-19. Um, I'm getting word that they're going to start opening up June, July. So the ones that normally we would have entered wine maybe February, March, April are being pushed back. And I can guarantee you that the Montepulciano Chalano and the Pinot Grigio are going straight to competition. That's very exciting. So we do have a question from the audience and it says, do you pick food and pair the wine or do you pick the wine? and then pair the food. And I think that this is a fantastic question. I mean. I think you can do it either way. If you have a lot of food and a lot of wine, I mean, you can go back and forth. I, I think sometimes if you have certain dishes, certain dishes lend themselves to certain wines. So if I was out and a lot of our folks, we have really good barbecue down here in Ovilla uh, and uh, right across from the winery, a lot of folks, go over there and they grab barbecue and what do they come for? The UNT Tempranillo. The Tempranillo pairs great with barbecue and fajitas. The Pinot Grigio pairs great with fish, with shrimp, and with even Thai food. So for most people, it's what meal they have on hand. And then hopefully they've got a good wine selection from Tesoro and they can pick the wine that goes with the food. Uh, other times though, you may have a certain wine that you're ready to open, somebody gives it to you, it's a gift, you really want to try it, and you say, okay, I have this particular wine, let me see what food I can make that will best pair with that, with that particular wine. So you can do it either way. Uh, I think most people kind of start off with the food and say, this is what we have in our pantry, or this is what's in our refrigerator, or we're going out to dinner, what wine is going to go with this food? I think my daughter's macaroni and cheese is going to taste delicious with this. I mean, for those of you with small kids at home, I think it'll work perfectly fine. So try it out. Let me know what you think. Um, if you are just now logging in, whether it's through Zoom or Facebook Live, first want to say welcome. Second off, I want to reintroduce you to our um, our winemaker and alumnus, John Matthews of Casara Winery. We are tasting. We just finished tasting the Pinot Grigio, which is delightful and refreshing, very dry, uh, which is one of my personal favorite ways to go about wine. So now we're about to jump over to the rosé. Is that right, John? Yeah, this is our Sangiovese rosé, Avante uh, rosé, we call it. And Avante in Italian means forward. This is a very fruit forward wine, and yet it's 100% Sangiovese, 
and a dry rosé wine. You don't find many dry rosé wines. That's it, Casey. Finish the Pinot Grigio and then let's move on to that. You busted me. I Stop looking. Don't, don't look at me. Don't look at me. Take things. I'm ready to move on to the next course. And the people are like, let, let, me, let me do this. And then we'll move to the next course. So well, the, it's, a, it's a dry 100% San Giovese. This is our most popular wine. It's our biggest seller. Uh, and it's our biggest award winner. This uh, has won seven international awards. Um, and and we uh, last year alone, we were really lucky with about 16 international awards, about 30 total awards. Uh, this wine was picked one of the 12 best in Texas, a blue ribbon winner at the State Fair of Texas, and was picked at the Houston Rodeo, which if you know uh, anything about wine competitions, they have one of the largest competitions, about 3,300 wineries, about 24 countries around the world. This one, best in class. So we're really, really pleased about this. Um, and this is your perfect summertime wine. Sit by the pool. Um, again, we look at the clarity on it. So Casey, if you have four out, is Joe helping you? Is Joe pouring for you? Joe is hooking me up. I right, am yeah. going to have to tip this kid really well. <laughs> Well, hey, and a shout out to my son, Joseph, who is graduating in two weeks from high school, and we're really proud of him. So thank you, Joseph. Um, he just gave it. <laughs> there you go. The rosés you can see, beautifully clear. Beautifully Wait, can I, clear. John, hold on. How do we what? cleanse our palate? What do we do about that? Well, you know, so if Joseph gave you some of the oyster crackers, you he can did. go ahead and there you go. Look. Have an oyster cracker and uh, a little sip of water if you want. Uh, this will help cleanse your palate. But really, between whites and rosé, we don't have to do that um, because they're, they're, they're so similar. But let's go ahead and have an oyster cracker. That'll be a little hors d'oeuvre. I didn't have time to make some hors d'oeuvres for you today. I will mute myself so you don't have to hear me chew. But this is a great idea. We were actually making wine all day, and that's what we were doing. That's what's important, right? Take care of the important stuff and make sure that we've got plenty of wine in the wine room for everybody. Guys, so, he's, not, he's not kidding. When I got here, he was covered head to toe in red splatter, and I went, <laughs> what happened? You know, was it a crime scene or wine? What's happening, John? <laughs> well, with my life, it could be either, Casey, so you right. never know. It, it, it just depends. 37 years in law enforcement, I'm always in crime scenes, but no, that was actually a wine explosion out in the uh, out in the back of the winery. Um, each week, we're testing our wines, we're making sure that they're balanced, that they're as good as they can possibly be. And I'm really finicky about this. And sometimes the boys are telling me, "Dad, you know, you can test it in ten times. We love it. Let's serve it. We've given it to to uh, our you know folks who come in." They love it. It's ready. And I'm just like, ah, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure. So literally, yes, I've been working since early this morning on some of the new wines that we're going to be introducing to our clients literally over the next six and eight months. That's really fascinating. So John, did, when you start to develop a wine, do you have a, a, a taste and, and quality and clarity and everything in mind before you go out to do it? Or is it just a, an experiment? What is your thought process on? Well, no, I have it in mind, but you know, uh, as you know, Casey, we don't have any blends here. Um, uh, the kind of the traditional Italian way is to let the grape speak for itself, and so I'm pretty pit, uh, finicky about the grapes that we get, the grapes that we grow, and I really want the grapes to express themselves as much as possible. But uh, but sometimes you have to take what nature gives you, and sometimes the grape isn't as mature as you want. Um, you had to harvest it because of weather conditions. Uh, maybe it doesn't have the tannin structure or the color that you want. And so you have to work with it. You have to work with it. And, and with the wines that we oak, we're testing them constantly to see, is it oaked enough? You know, does it have that great oak kind of vanilla flavor that we want? Is it too overpowering? You know, some wines you're going to want more. Some wines you're going to want less. So I think we're constantly tinkering with the wine to get it where we want it to be. Um, and, and like I said, if anything, I think we let our wines go a little bit longer than a lot of folks. And I think it, it shows in the quality of, of the wines that we serve. Uh, this particular Sangiovese, 
Like I said, great color, great clarity. People comment on the color all the time. Let me just give you a little hint. Um, so uh, 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 if your husband's listening, he can uh, pick this up for you. This wine is so popular uh, among our ladies that we actually had somebody come in and say that if I gave her some uh, Avanti Rosé wine, she would turn it into an entire basket for us. And so we've got bath salts, bath soap, bath candles in a little kit. And uh, we hear from a lot of our customers that the ladies will light their candle and smell the Avanti Rosé and put it in their bath and sit and drink a nice bottle of uh, Avanti Rosé as they're in the bathtub. That is really fascinating, and I hope that they don't get any of those things confused and try and eat or drink the wrong thing. But anyway, I, I digress. So, That's really neat. So uh, let's smell this one, uh, Casey. And certainly this, uh, you can smell the fruit. Again, Avante, very fruit forward. This has a nice mix, though, of not only fruit, but floral. I'm picking up a lot of flowers in this too. Yeah. Uh, I'm picking up, well, what are you picking up? Let me ask, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, I told you I'm not very good at this. Uh, uh, I agree, uh, sir. <laughs> I, I'm picking up honeysuckles and yeah. I'm picking up a little bit of rose in this. So whereas the Pinot Grugio was more of a fruit, now I'm getting a fruit, you know, uh, front on it, but I'm also getting that floral, rose, honeysuckle, and, and what does that tell my brain? Wow, I'm really expecting something good. And um, it, it, yeah, you're gonna compare the two, right? I am, yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very different. And I will say I've had this one, so I know what I'm about to try and I love this wine and it's also dry, but it's amazing how different the, the aromas are and yeah, very florally. Because this one's more fruit forward, and this one has fruit and floral in it, and uh, you really pick up those floral aromas in the rosé. Um, the uh, uh, taste, how is this going to taste? All right, this is already, it looks good, it smells fantastic. Our brain is really uh, waiting for something. Our rosé uh, people come in, our red drinkers will come in and I'll always start them with this rosé because again, it's 100% Sangiovese. And they'll say, oh no, no, we don't want a rosé. They're used to a sweet rosé. They're used to a red blend. Uh, a lot of places will blend some of their less expensive wine to get that. This is 100% Sangiovese great. And when you taste it, it, it's just amazing. So let's go ahead. Well, I think you skipped a, a, a portion of our experience here, John. We didn't talk about the lack of legs on this guy. Oh, uh, this, yeah, the, uh, if you look, the legs are just a little bit more than the Pinot Grigio. If you kind of twirl it on your side a little bit and you see them kind of roll down there, yeah. um, so we, we can see that, but this does not have very much more alcohol. So it's not going to be substantially different in the legs. And like I said, most of our wines are in a fairly tight range here. Um, and so they're going to be very, very similar in that. But uh, when you taste it, what are you picking up? I, you said honeysuckle, and that's what my mind keeps coming back to. It, it is, that's, that's it for me. It's and if you were, if you had, and Casey was out back earlier, not that she was here drinking all day, folks. I don't want you to say that, but um, no, she wasn't. She'd been playing mom all day. But we have tons of honeysuckles along the creek. And when the folks sit outside um, in their lawn chairs or picnic tables or they're listening to live music that we have every Friday from six to nine, um, they're smelling the honeysuckles, they're drinking the wine. They're tasting it, and it really gives it a very good, well-rounded experience. Absolutely. John, I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment because we have a few really good questions rolling in here. So one of them, talking about cooking, and I know that I particularly, guys, don't, don't get me on this one, but I'll buy the cheapest wine possible whenever I'm cooking, right, because you're cooking it. And so somebody asks, um, where did it go? Sorry. What foods pair well with the dry wine and is it good for cooking with? Is it better to cook with a dry wine or a sweet wine? Um, almost all the time I cook with a dry wine. Uh, of course, I make mostly Italian dishes when I make my 
sauce for my pasta and everything, or I'm doing meatballs or anything like that, I'm using a dry wine, usually a dry red Italian wine, like our Nebbiolo, the Montepulciano, a Cabernet, you know. So what, what I usually do when I'm cooking, so if you come to the house on Sunday, you're going to see a little wine in the sauce and a little wine in my glass. And then a little wine with the meatballs and a little wine in my glass. So by the time on, we sit down and have lunch, it's a very happy lunch, let me tell you. Just on Sunday? Well, that's when I... <laughs> down to cook the big meals. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Hey, you just answered one of the other questions, which was what other reds does the vineyard offer? So if you'll just kind of run through that list one more time real quick, so people can kind of check that out. In the vineyard, we have the Sangiovese grape, which is a grape from Northern Italy. And that grows very, very well. And we also have the Tempranillo grape from North Texas Tempranillo. And the Tempranillo is a Spanish grape. Again, the climate is very similar here to where it's grown in Spain. And so it very, very, they grow very well. And the white grape that we have is our El Burrito grape. And the El Burrito grape, we make both a sweet and a dry white wine with that grape. So with the El Burrito, is it the Breve El Burrito? What, it, what is that particular wine about? The, the Breve, Breve means short and, okay. and crisp in Italian. That is the dry El Burrito. So we have that version. We have our Luce, which means light, and that is more of a sweet El Barino. And then we actually, today, we're finishing a brand new one that we're coming out with, which is our Ponte El Barino. That is Ponte in Italian, uh, it means bridge, Ponte Vecchio in Florence. So Ponte means bridge, and that's our bridge from where our sweet whites kind of end and where the Moscato on the other side, which is a very, very sweet white, I kind of call it a cupcake wine, and the Ponte's kind of bridge in between our white wines and our cupcake are really, really sweet wine. Well, that's really exciting. Thank you for sharing all of those. Let's see here. Did I? Oh, what's the deal with the spit buckets that we see everybody spitting in? So a lot of times when you're in a wine tasting or specifically when you're in a wine judging contest, they're only going to take a very little bit of the wine. Uh, and depending on who the judge is, they may swallow only a very, very small portion of the wine, or they may take the entire portion, spit it into the spit bucket, and then they're going to rinse their glass out. They may try some more and then spit it back into the spit bucket. Um, so we actually, uh, we encourage people pouring it into the spit bucket in the uh, tasting room. Um, but yes, if you're in a wine judging or a wine competition, Many times you'll see the judges, they've got their water next to them, they've got their spit bucket next to them. I didn't bring one in here today, I wasn't gonna spit in front of you. And they've got their uh, crackers or something to cleanse their palate in between each one of the tastings. Um, in a wine competition, yeah, they may be judging 60, 70, 80 wines in a competition. And so obviously you can't drink a lot of each one of those wines. No, and that's definitely not a challenge either, ladies and gentlemen. So don't, don't do that. That's not safe. <laughs> okay, so John, I, you know, I, I cannot believe it's already 438 and you've got customers coming in through the door, but we have saved the best for last in my personal opinion. So tell us about our North Texas Tempranillo, please. The North Texas Tempranillo, as I say, it really grows great here in Texas. It is an up and coming wine in Texas. We have two versions of, of it here in the winery. The uh, UNT wine, which if you go buy our basic Tempranillo, every single bottle is UNT. So don't come in here asking for, oh, give me a generic Tempranillo. You're going to get our UNT Tempranillo. We also offer a reserve Tempranillo um, that, that uh, is a, a off of a much older vine. Um, so the UNT Tempranillo, is, is very bold. Um, we'll pour it in our glass here. Casey, can you still hear me? We can hear you, but we lost video. I'm going to send one of your very intelligent tech savvy sons in there to check on you. So yes, because I'm seeing your daughter's face right now. You're back. And she's gone. All right. Can you see me? I can see you. All right. So the North Texas Temperate, okay, we may have to call home and uh, let her know that uh, you're not on the phone. Well, 
We're okay. working on it. Just a second, everybody. <laughs> Just one of the technical difficulties, but as long as you can hear me, um, uh, I'm sure the video will be back in a second. So I poured some of the UNT Tempranillo, the North Texas Tempranillo in the glass here. Again, what we're doing, we're kind of twirling around. We're looking at the legs. You can obviously case, see Casey, the legs are longer on this. It takes longer for the, for the wine to wash down the cup. That says it is a little higher alcohol volume than the other two wines that we tasted. We look at the color and that's a great dark Tempranillo. Uh, got a very good color as I kind of hold it up to the light. Uh, I don't, you know, it's been filtered. It looks really, really good. And then of course we're gonna smell it. And you can see the, uh, the aroma coming off of this glass. You can smell um, the fruit forwardness of this Tempranillo. I'm picking up, I'm picking up several kind of different fruits here. Maybe some berry, some cherry. Um, that that's kind of what I, what I'm I'm smelling. Yep. Uh, but it, but it's really really attractive. I mean, so the aroma coming off of the Tempranillo is look is really kind of exciting. My taste buds are saying yes, I can see it. It looks great. I can smell it. Totally different than the other two wines that we right. tasted, which were the Pinot Grigio, which was the crisp white, the rosé, which is a dry rosé. This is a dry Tempranillo. It's got good structure, got good tannins, got a nice fruit front on it. And so we're going to get to taste it. And the taste, very, very smooth. And that's the comment that we get from most of the people here at Casaro Winery. They come in, they buy the UNT wine, which is really, really fun for me, especially if they graduated from another university and they have another ring on, they get the UNT wine, but that's how good the Tempranillo is, is they're gonna come in and order this UNT wine. Uh, very, very, very good, very smooth. I think that's the number one comment that we get from our customers is this is a very drinkable wine, a very smooth wine. And like I said, it really pairs well um, with barbecue, with fajitas. Um, you're getting a little of the pepper in the taste, uh, very slight smoke, which is another attribute of the Tempranillo, uh, but it is very smooth, great finish on this wine. Very, it, it's got a, it's smooth, but bold. And I love this, but just the hint of spice in it. I really do appreciate that. Uh -oh. Other questions about the UNT Tempranillo? It looks like you're monitoring your computer. There, I Dave. am, I sure am. Not any just yet, but I am curious a little bit. I know we've talked a little bit about your, um, your, your history as in working in law enforcement and, um, so I'm curious, your degree that you got from UNT, were you a criminal justice major or what did you, what exactly did you study? And do you feel like UNT did a good job preparing you for that? Well, pe people ask me that all the time. They said you've been in law enforcement, you know, 37 years. You've worked with all of the federal agencies. You work with law enforcement all over the country. Did you have a criminal justice degree? And I go, no. And they said, well, you've written seven books, including The Eyeball Killer, which not only became a, a true crime book of the month, it was picked up by Doubleday, went international, really, really happy about that one, being made into a feature film. You know, were you an English major? I'm like, no, I'm a good editor, but no, I wasn't an English major. And then they asked me, well, you've been on CNN and Fox News for over 25 years. So obviously you are radio TV film, which is a great degree, right? At North Texas. And I said, of course I wasn't. Um, so I was a business major. I graduated from the College of Business. And let me tell you, that has helped me in all of the different hats that I get to wear in my different careers. And you know me, Casey, I'm not really good at sitting still. I like challenges. I like uh, new endeavors and everything. And the business degree from North Texas really helped me along the way with all of those different, uh, different things that I got to do. I was able to apply a lot of the lessons from my, uh, my bachelor's and my master's, and even did a little bit of work in organizational policy and theory. 
And I can tell you that when you're wearing a lot of different hats, the business degree is really invaluable. Because if you know your business degree, you have a little accounting and a little finance, a little marketing and a little management, you know, and, and, and with my field, administrative management and a lot of planning, a lot of organizational studies. And so for me, that really was great. And now that I have the winery and the vineyard, I'm putting my business degree to use more than I ever have before. And I've been very fortunate in my life. I've had a Venture 100 company. I've had an Inc. 500 company. But never have I had companies like the winery because you're an agricultural company out in the vineyard growing the grapes. You're a manufacturing company when you're taking the grapes and turning them into wine. And then your tasting room is a retail company. And so with this venture, you're actually running three different, totally separate organizations. Um, and they've got to be running in unison. And you've got to make sure that the grapes are ready and they're perfectly good to go and that your manufacturing is ready to take those grapes and that you know how long you're going to age them and how you've got to process them. And as you know, we work a couple of years ahead of ourselves. I know so the grapes, the wine that you're tasting now, you know, we're from 16, 17, 18 vintages. And only right now are whites from the 19 vintage are coming in. So you're always a couple of years ahead of yourself. And right now we're planning on the, the 2020 harvest, what we're going to have, and working with other growers around the state to anticipate how much we need to have so that in 2022, you have some great wine to drink. So the business degree has really, really helped me all throughout each one of my individual careers. That's fantastic to hear. In fact, John, I, another thing that we kind of, um, I guess, bonded over is the fact that we were both first generation college students and, and the first in our family to graduate with a degree. And that's something to be incredibly proud of. And so now that you've uh, created this North Texas Tempranillo for us, a portion of every bottle that is sold, you're giving back to the Alumni Association to help fund student scholarships. So someone is asking, exactly how much have we raised for scholarships so far since the launch in November? What are we well, averaging? Since, uh, from November to the end of the year, we donated over $2,000 in new scholarship money to the university. Uh, but you know what, Casey? Even with COVID and even with being closed down 66 days or whatever it is, um, our alumni have still supported us and still ordered wine. And we were able to almost match that amount during this COVID period. And so we were able to donate thousands of extra dollars to the UNT Alumni Association and student scholarships. And it, it, it's not millions of dollars, but let me tell you, as somebody that was a first generation student, those $500 checks that I got and those $1,000 scholarship checks that I received really, really helped a lot. And so we're hoping to, to help a lot of kids out there put that money into our scholarship fund. And Taryn does a great job in the alumni office and in overseeing that. And, and we hope that as our endeavor grows throughout the year and we're able to expand our UNT wines, that that money grows also. And, you know, we'd like to see that an annual five-figure donation going into our scholarship fund every single year. And uh, that, that really makes me happy when folks come in and they say, listen, not only am I alum, but I want to contribute and help other kids that need scholarships. That's right. And John, we can't thank you enough for your generosity and your humility and selflessness to give back to our current students through this program. Um, I know that there's a, a tremendous need out there. So, you know, if you guys are interested, enjoy a, a delicious Tempranillo, definitely order some. It's never too late. But also with graduation happening like right now, Guys, John is filling orders daily, so if you would like to order a bottle for a recent graduate that is 21 and older, mind you, then please do so. What a great way to, what a great gift, how special to celebrate that graduate from UNT. So we really want to encourage you to do that. And then one last, one last question for you before we hop off here, John, is um, right. how does the Tempranillo store, do we wait to drink or drink immediately? Oh, with any wine, I think what you want to do is drink it immediately. You can store it for a while. Um, it has been aged, but it's not one of the wines like 
one of our wines, we have certain wines of old age for several years, three, four, five years, and then you can store them a lot longer and, and they're gonna be more robust as they stay in the bottle. I think this Tempranillo, buy a bottle, drink it now, save another one as long as you can, maybe two weeks or a month, but drink that, you can keep ordering, and Casey, CasaraWines.com. That's where we go to order the wine, to buy the UNT wine that goes to our scholarship fund. So CasaraWines.com, C-A-S-S-A-R-O, um, and make a contribution to our scholarship fund. Thank you so much, John. This is such a treat. So fantastic, guys. It's not too late to order any of the wines that we tried today. So hop online and do that. You can also access the website through the UNT Alumni Association website, untalumni.com. Did I say that right, Claudia? I think yes. So. I should know that by heart, right? Uh, so and come thanks. visit us like Casey. We're down in Ovilla. We're literally uh, 20 minutes off of downtown Dallas, five minutes off of I-35 South. Really convenient for Dallas, Fort Worth, Arlington, anywhere in the Metroplex. We have lots of Frisco, Plano, McKinney folks. Uh, we have three acres of beautiful outdoor space. That's where I'm going to go sit as soon as we're done. <laughs> and I'm going to stay in the air conditioning. So <laughs> cheers and go mean green. And Claudia, we're going to turn it back to you. Thanks again. And we hope we'll see you next week. Go mean green. Go mean green.